Hey. hey everyone. So I noticed on moderator that someone said, why do we have testing and tooling in the same panel? So uh, we will try to cover both topics equally. And with that, please join me in welcoming Simon Stewart. He works at Facebook and he is known for uh, creating Selenium and WebDriver. Next to him is Remy Sharp, who is the creator of JS Bin, JS uh, Console, and he curates the Full Frontal Conference. David Blumen from BBC News, who is the testing superhero there. And next to him is Paul Irish, who is our opener. He is uh, a guru on the Chrome Developer Relations team, and he is also known for many, many developer tools, such as Modernizer, Yeoman, et cetera, et cetera. So I will invite Paul to give an excellent introduction. All right, um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go fast on this, and I apologize because I'm speaking with an accent for probably most of you. Um, but we're gonna go quick. First, I'm gonna kind of give a lay of the land of kind of the tooling ecosystem, and then I'm gonna give uh, a few demos, kind of showcasing some of the cool stuff that's emerging or kind of things you might not have seen in this area. So first, it's hard to kind of contextualize as far as all the things that are captured by like tooling. Uh, this is one approach. Adi Osmani and I worked on this, um, kind of laying out a bunch of the tools as far as the life cycle of a project, from boilerplate to abstractions, the, the, the application stack, and then into workflow performance and builds. But then we on the team, on the on the group here, we're, we're thinking about something along these lines too. These, this is very much in the tooling vein, the package and dependency management of uh, my my application source code what my editing experience is like, what the tools that the browser actually provides is. Uh, when it comes to testing, both unit testing, integration testing, CSS testing, I'm gonna show a demo of some of that. Then build and deployment, <clears throat> how I'm automating browsers, I'm probably gonna be doing that inside continuous integration. And then there's a lot inside mobile, so handling mobile devices, whether they're local or in the cloud, there's a lot. So I wanna dive into a few things. So CSS testing, this is a, this is a fantastic, uh, slide deck and site put together by Simon Medine uh, that's just focused on four styles. How can we better have a feel for um, if we're screwing up or not? One of the projects that's uh, listed here, a number of these are pretty uh, young projects, but this one uh, called Fighting Layout Bugs has been around for about three years. Um, it's actually offered uh, in Java, mostly for use with Maven, um, and it does things like these five tests here. One of them is detect a text near or overlapping vertical edge. Uh, and, but what you'll end up is this sort of test. So you can actually detect when you have text that's running up against something like an image or even overflowing here. Um, and this is completely automated, so on every commit, uh, finding layout bugs is going to make sure that you do not have uh, one of these problems in your target browsers. Pretty cool. Um, so you might be running this inside continuous integration, and I've seen a lot of movement here recently. Travis has kind of like opened up everyone's eyes in the open source world as far as what can be done here. Uh, this, is, this here is Travis um, running the new Dojo 2 uh, tests. And so actually, uh, Travis pulled down the latest uh, Dojo 2 uh, source, built out uh, what it needed, and then it connected up to Sauce Labs um, and opened up a bunch of desktop and mobile browsers and ran the test suite of of uh, Dojo 2 on all of them, reported back, and now for every single commit and every single pull request, we know um, if we're looking good and green or not. Uh, telemetry was mentioned a little bit before, and I just wanted to give a better idea of uh, what it does and how it works. Unfortunately, it requires a checkout of the um, Chromium code base, which is about five gigs, and I didn't want to pull that down on the Wi-Fi, so let me just talk it out. Uh, Telemetry would take something like this page. Now it's gonna do something like scroll the page down, and then it's gonna pop back up and scroll it down again. While it did those two things, it's gonna be extracting a bunch of metrics from the browser, like what was the paint rate? How many million pixels per second are being painted? Uh, what was the FPS? Um, and now it's gonna take all these metrics and provide them to me in a nice way, and then I can take this and plot it out against time or against all my commits and see, are my performance thresholds being met as the project is growing and as it's living, or am I adding, or me and my teammate adding things to it that kill the, the visual performance? So there's a lot of power here. Another project from the Chromium uh, team is called Endure. And this is something where you can write a test like, okay, open up Gmail, 
Start composing. Now discard. Start composing again. Discard. Repeat this for six hours. <laughs> now tell me what's up. <clears throat> so Endure will take this and just handle the browser automation for you. Uh, and then it will give you back some really fantastic insight on the memory consumption of this application over time um, across a number of different axes. So you're able to understand if you're increasing uh, in an uncontrollable way in your memory situation. All right. <clears throat> now, we've seen a lot of new uh, advancements when it comes to mobile and cross-device testing. Uh, this was a project I bet a number of you have seen called Remote Preview, where I can take, uh, let's see, navigate to a URL here on my machine, and all the browsers follow my navigation. Uh, Adobe Edge Inspect also has a similar functionality. Um, and so it's cool. I got all these phones right here, and they're just following me around. It's pretty fantastic. Mixture is another project. <clears throat> does some fantastic things. It also does the same thing, but, it all, but it, on top of this, it will add, let's say, there's a button. I click it, it pops up a dialog, and I close that dialog. Mixture will do the same stuff, but actually uh, repeat those same actions on all these uh, devices as well. So not just navigation, but actual click events. Uh, so you can see and verify that things are occurring the way you, you would expect. Now, I think it's cool to have all this on like devices that are next to you, but you know, not everyone can afford all the devices that you need to actually support. So we've been seeing things like cloud browser testing. Browser stack is one I think most people are familiar with. Um, and for mobile, they use emulated, uh, they use emulators, which is cool. Um, Device Anywhere actually features real devices, uh, which is pretty cool. It's a, it's a paid service, though. They did just recently offer this uh, free uh, service. So I'm opening up an iPhone 4S. And uh, so this is actually a real device. Um, and I'm able to kind of play around with it. I'm going to open up Google News and click around. I can also do. Let's see, I can mimic a swipe and see that. And you can see that the, the performance here is actually pretty good. Um, it's telling me that my latency is OK. Um, and so this could actually even get quite a bit better. But it's pretty fantastic to connect to an actual device and get a, get a better idea of what my performance situation is on that. <clears throat> This is a project that is totally alpha and has never really been shown uh, at all. Uh, so I just want an FYI. It's got some rough edges, but it's pretty cool. It's a project uh, from some engineers at Google. It's called Tracing Framework. And it's a bunch of um, uh, analyses for um, smoothness inside of the browser. Um, and so the cool thing about it is the instrumentation is written, written in completely in JavaScript, which means it runs in Chrome, Firefox, IE, mobile browsers, and web views. So if you ever feel like you're in a situation where you do not have the browser tooling uh, to give you enough insight um, in any of these situations, check out Tracing Framework. Still, it's rough and alpha, but it's worth a look. Now, uh, this conversation wouldn't be complete without talking about the dev tools that are in the browser. Um, and I wanted to show a few things. <clears throat> the first up is Canvas inspection. Uh, and the cool thing is we've never showed this before, and uh, it's coming out. It's still kind of uh, an experiment but I'm excited to show it. So I brought up here this WebGL Aquarium. It's pretty cool. Now over in Profiles, we see Capture Canvas Frame, but I actually need to uh, have the DevTools open while this canvas is created. <clears throat> now I'm going to capture that frame. And up here, it looks like we captured about uh, 4,300 calls to the context. And these are all the calls that were made that changed the context. And I can step through all of them and what it's going to do is it's going to replay all the calls up to this point. And I can see, uh, I can step through all the draw calls. Let's see. Give me some fishes. Fishes. <laughs> Fresh fish. Um, yeah, good, great. Fishes. So <clears throat> we're able to see step by step as this as this frame is being constructed, and, um, and correlate that back to my actual code of, of what was happening. Now, so I can click over there and see this, in fact, was making these draw calls. Now, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but when I actually clicked from profiles over into, uh, into the sources panel, there was a little bit of a delay. Now, let's say I actually wanted to figure out why there's such a delay there. So first, I'm going to undock this. 
over that guy, and I think you see what's happening here is that I'm using the dev tools on the dev tools. I'm going to start a new timeline, and I'm going to repeat this action. And there we go, I captured that. So inside the timeline, we're getting some good information on how long things like paints, recalc styles are all taking. And over here on the left-hand side, we can see this yellow, and this is my click event. And we can see that it was pretty long. It, in this case, it took almost 400 milliseconds to complete that. Now, why was that? Eesh. So you look over here, and you see this is what happened inside that time. We got a lot of recalculate style and layout and recalc style layout. And this is what we were talking about before when we were talking about excess reflows, layout thrashing. Um, Layout and reflow are the same thing uh, across browsers. Um, but this is a bad situation. This is a pattern you want to avoid. And the cool thing here is the dev tools are actually telling you this. Uh, there's a little indicator that says, you might have a problem. For synchronous layout is a possible performance bottleneck. And the fact that we're seeing this nonstop back and forth means there's probably an ability to optimize. So Pavel, you should probably optimize this in the dev tools. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. <clears throat> so a lot of times, um, there is a problem with paint. Paint is consuming a lot of time, and it's a little hard to get a feel um, for what's going on. So it, earlier in some talks, they brought up continuous page repainting. And I want to show what that looks like. Um, let's try this guy. Yeah, cool. All right. <clears throat> Bringing back the dev tools, I'm going to dock them again. And over here in the settings, I'm going to turn on continuous page repainting. So up here, we get an idea of how long it's taking to paint the, this page right here. So it's taking, let's say, right now it's taking about 15 milliseconds. But first, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to turn off some of the styles. So on each of these little Chrome logos, I got a box shadow and a border radius. I'm going to clear those off, and my paint time jumps down, which is good. It's much cheaper to paint this page. Now, the interesting thing here is that because I have this live feedback and kind of play around, I can see what is contributing to long paints. So if I add on border radius, you can see it jumped up from about twos and threes up to the fours and fives. Cool. Take that off and put on box shadow, which is normally kind of expensive, you hear. But my paint time is actually pretty reasonable. Um, but check this out. I add both of them. Ooh, and my paint time just went up to about 20 milliseconds per, uh, per frame. And so I, I get great feedback here on what is actually contributing. It turns out that by themselves, these styles are actually not, they're pretty cheap. But in combination, uh, the browser takes a little bit of time on it. <clears throat> now, painting can be expensive, and there's a lot that could be done. Um, and I wanted to show one thing that has been done recently. So, cool. <clears throat> this right here is uh, Chrome for Android stable. Um, and so we have an H, uh, article on HTML5 rocks. And what I'm going to do is just scroll the page. Scroll. There we go. Cool. And you see I'm like scrolling down, and the browser kind of keep catches up. But for a little while, the, the page is blank. And then it comes in. So. Probably not optimal. Um, we just added a new thing to Chrome on Android called multi-threaded painting. <clears throat> and so here, there we go. Here, uh, so this is Chrome for Android beta. You can get this from Google Play. Uh, now, if I scroll, I think you see that there's no white. That's cool. Another thing, you might be able to see it, is the text actually gets a little blurry when this is going too fast. And we have low-res tiles that are kind of in place just in case you, you're moving really, really fast that it will resolve to the crisp picture that you're looking for. But so this actual painting is happening on a separate thread, which is pretty cool. One, for the, for the performance benefit, but two, for, for speed. Over here, this is about tracing. I think this has been mentioned before as well. <coughs> Here we get a kind of, I mean, this looks intimidating. And it, it is, but there's good ways to read these things. Uh, so right now I'm zooming in on the render main thread. This is the UI thread. This is the don't block this thread thread. Um, there's a lot of other parts in the browser, like the compositor up here. Uh, but I'm going to jump in to this guy and zoom in. And down here, we got a few things. V8 call function. This is JavaScript. JavaScript is running right now. 
And then all of a sudden we hit picture record. So this is a capture from Chrome Canary on desktop doing multi-threaded multi painting. And this picture record is actually recording all the draw calls that are coming into uh, Chrome. And Chrome is like, okay, I got all these draws. Here, here they are. I'm going to pass it up to the compositor. Compositors are like, cool. I'm going to spawn off a new thread, this compositor worker, and he's going to take care of this for you. So compositor worker right here, he's doing the paint. Uh, this paint raster right here is the actual paints. And what this means is because this is on a separate thread, I can now be executing JavaScript at the same time. So here we are in V8 executing JavaScript at the same time as I'm doing paints. We haven't been able to do this before, but now it's finally happening. I'm really excited about that. All right. The last thing uh, I just want to mention is I'm not going to demo remote debugging, but everything that I just showed uh, is available. Just the same thing, just connecting on here. Um, really fantastic because the performance characteristics on a device with hardware that is such diff so different as a laptop is something that you really want to be very mindful of as you're developing all these experiences. Lastly, a few trends I think I've been kind of witnessing and, and will continue in 2013. Um, we're seeing a rise of people leveraging continuous integration, not just for running things like unit tests, but also making sure that there's no performance regressions as the project is built out. Things like people are focusing on a better mobile debugging workflow and making sure that for, for throwing tests on there, getting tests out of it, um, and, and, and seeing their work, that everything is working very nicely. A bigger adoption of using dependency management, not just for third-party libraries, but also for your own application code, and people being very mindful of performance from the beginning of the project, so that a project can sail nicely from these devices to these devices, and all your, user you, all your users are happy. That's it for this little opener, and let's get into the panel. Okay, yeah, that's all we have. Okay, let's drink. <laughs> okay. okay. So there's there's like thirty questions on moderator and thirty three and let's let's just try to get as much through. Okay, so the the first question that that Adi Osmani, also from Google Chrome Developer Relations, put on moderator was: Mo mobile is big focus for developer for developers this year. So, what do you see as being the biggest pain points in the mobile test uh, mobile tooling landscape? And I think everyone can just chip in what they think. So, let's start from Remy. Uh, um, the other browsers is the big pain point for me at the moment. Um, the fact that I've got dev tools on, um, on Android is, is amazing, but then I have to use Safari, um, and that's horrible for me. Um, and that, it's kind of set me up to, I've started a project in my company um, very, very early days where I'm trying to get the point ultimately to just use dev tools to debug every single mobile platform. Um, Safari, Firefox, Opera, Chrome, Windows, um, all of them using the debugger protocol and um, not it's not so much of an automation at all and you know there's, it's having the hardware there but using just dev tools to go in and kind of do that micro debugging but have one familiar tool um, and just debug the other tools. I mean I, I hate working with the Safari's remote debugger, it's great that we've got it but um, I really really struggle with the tool. Um, so the pain point for me is is the other the the dev it just kind of exposes how bad the other dev tools are. I mean, IE ten mobile that's great browser, but where are the dev tools? Yeah, yeah. Simon. Okay. Um, so the the desktop world was su surprisingly simple, entirely by accident, but it was surprisingly simple. Um, we only had web apps running in a browser. And that was fine. The mobile world, because the devices are underpowered and they're a little bit puny, 
and Moore's Law is helping, but they are improving. Uh, the, the apps we get when we need to test aren't just running in a browser. They're running in web views contained within a native application, and you need to be able to test the communication between the native part of the app and the web part of the app and the web part and the native part, and who knows, right? It's a complete nightmare. Um, so not only do we have a more complex testing environment to begin with, the tooling just isn't there. It, it, it's still early days. Um, you know, there are very few few tools out there that can actually be used to test a hybrid application um, successfully and in a way that won't cause your developers to scream at you uh, in, in, in just pure rage and frustration. We'll get there one day, but it's that's the main pain point, just that the tooling isn't there. Right. Uh, yeah, similar to, uh, to Remy, but I mean, what, what we can use... Uh, <laughs> The um, I mean, like I don't like Safari at all, so I don't use it. But um, the generic Web Inspector remote has been quite successful, quite useful for me. Um, but the, that's only for WebKit browsers. But what about everything else? And things like Blackberries, which is still very high usage, and something like News, it's very difficult to do anything with. Um, and then automations, iOS and and Android are pretty much the only two platforms. So you're you're stuck with them. Even the new platforms like BlackBerry, how do you even approach them with, with no tools? The, the, you can't do much with them. So there's, there's a lot lacking. And hopefully, well, hopefully some people, some nice people, will come along and build something new and, and the tools will mature. But there's still the legacy browsers and operating systems that we're going to have to deal with for a long time. So tooling is, is going to get better, but it's also going to stay bad at the same time. Um, I would say one one part of this is that I think that <clears throat> a lot of developers' workflow for their mobile testing is is extremely manual. It is a matter of of putting you know putting up the newest version on stage, hitting refresh, seeing, exploring, then going to the next device that has the viewport that they care about, hitting refresh, testing that. And I think it's just really slow. And and there's a lot of existing solutions that can totally improve that. Um, and I, I think. I think that's worth looking into. The other part that I think is, is important, and I mentioned this um, in the opening, which is that I don't think you know every developer can afford all the devices that they need to be testing on. And so I, I mean, the the remote debugging capability um, that that we're seeing is very important when you have the device there. Um, but I do think that, um, but having access to um, being able to run your web application in these mo uh, mobile devices that you do not actually own is really important. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can solve that. Uh, yeah. Great. OK, so let's continue on that. And the next question, question is, what are currently the best tools or work workflows for testing and debugging mobile devices? And I think David can start this. Yeah, so I've tried to, uh, I mean, in, in my role at the BBC, try to just use as many tools as I can, really, to get the, the best out of all the devices. But as as uh, as you said, it's a very manual process a lot of the time. Um, but we've, we've implemented recently uh, CSS regression testing, which internally we call snappy snaps. So it will capture two images of two domains. So we use our stage uh, and our live environment, uh, any different, ever, any, every religion we really want, and then various uh, asset types, so front page and story pages, and then compare them using image mag and magic to output a diff image, which you can then review. So you can test a massive amount of pages at different resolutions very quickly and identify the differences and then collaboratively decide how you want to move on from that. So the, there's tools like that that really just cut down the amount of manual testing you can do because you can just automate a lot of it. And then you can change, I mean, Image Magic is a very powerful tool, so you can use uh, percentage differences as well. So it's just a series of numbers that come out and you know whether you've got huge CSS regressions. Um, and again, tools like Web Inspector Remote and remote debugging on Android, especially if picking up uh, uh, networking things, um, like our, we use stats, making sure that stats are being recorded over De Chrome DevTools is so important. And using those tools has, has been really beneficial for, beneficial for us. Um, there are other tools like Remote Preview and Adobe Shadow, which you can use, but 
the, is, things like Adobe Shadow is um, or Edge Inspect is is a costly one, and I think that's where the cost element is quite difficult with mobile and responsive because you have you need all the devices in a lot of cases, and financially it's impossible to have for an independent or small small company. Um, Browse Stacks is a good option. Um, and I haven't really listened to looked into um, test plant, but um, it, it's it's an option as well. Um, but there there are some good tools. Um, I think if you're you're interested, there's a a great uh, amount of tools on the RGA Online uh, site, which point in the right direction. Okay, so Simon, what, what can you tell us about WebDriver? Ah, yeah, WebDriver. Um, so tools for doing testing on mobile. Um, the first thing I was going to suggest was. It isn't that different from being on a desktop, right? So you could use all the JavaScript frameworks that are already out, uh, are already out there. Things like Jasmine, for example, if you're a BDD fan, um, still work in a mobile browser. Um, and a mobile browser nowadays runs on a device that has the same power as sort of the old G5 Macs, right, that people used to do their development on. We think of them as underpowered devices. There are, they're, they're enormously capable, and they keep on getting faster. So you could keep on doing that. Um, I obviously have a vested interest. I am the lead of the Selenium project. I invented WebDriver. We're standardizing that with the W3C. Hopefully, the best way to test mobile browsers will be to use the WebDriver APIs, um, which will enable you to do all sorts of fun things, um, particularly from the point of view of automating a browser from a user's perspective. Go to this page, click on this link, execute this piece of JavaScript, now let me see what the text is on the page um, as a user would see it, which is an enormously powerful thing to do. Uh, and I've been on projects where sort of we've had those end-to-end -end tests, um, smaller integration tests, unit tests, realize that we've made some fundamental failures in, in the architecture of the application, thrown away every test apart from the web driver tests, and rebuilt everything just using those. Um, so if you write them well, they can work. Um, if I was going to name frameworks, uh, obviously Selenium is probably one that I would rush out and download right now. Um, I'm biased though, so that's okay. Uh, for mobile, it might be worth having a look at a thing called iOS Driver, which is written by Francois Reynard, um, who is working at eBay. Uh, and Source Labs recently sort of put a lot of weight behind a project called Appium. Um, so if you go to sourcelabs.com and take a look for Appium on their site, uh, you'll be able to find it. Both of those are for iOS, um, and they allow you to test native apps, hybrid apps, and just plain web apps as well. So that's pretty cool. On the Android platform, I think it's still fair game. There will be something that uses UI automation, and there's going to be a period of about a year, two years, where people go, what about the older versions of Android? They're still really popular, and then people will realize that it's a pain in the backside to test those things, and time will be on our side, and hopefully we'll only have uh, uh, ICS and above um, in about like 50 years or something of the way <laughs> that Android is, is updating. But it'll happen eventually, and that will be extremely cool. Want to add something, Remy? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm more in the kind of uh, debugging end of things. So, um, right. um, in fact, actually, for a project that we we were releasing for a client, literally Friday, we we're trying to kind of get the last <laughs> style changes in, and we've got this iPad Mini. And what I, what I ended up doing was using DevTools in Chrome, having it save as I was making changes to the local disk, and then I had Live Reload just sitting on there. And the UX guy was sat next to me with the iPad. I, and he was like, okay, just tweak this color. We, I tweak it on my desktop. And in the inspector, I'm changing the color and releasing, and it's immediately on his, um, on the, the uh, iPad uh, mini. Which for me, moving away from, um, not moving, getting away from kind of coding, saving, switching, hitting refresh, going to the device, hitting refresh, that's, that's where I live at the moment. And the closer I get to actually using the browser as my, development, uh, I, not IDE, but IDE, um, the happier I get. And you know, the, the, I want, I'm really f impatient. I want that feedback. I want to know now, and that's it. I, I want it all reloading live, and, and my workflow is, is getting really, really close to that. Um, and I see some of my guys working using, we, in JSBin, we've got a remote rendering 
feature in it so you can code away and it will just automatically kind of update right. on the device. And I see them actually using that as well, which is really cool um, for me. Uh, but yeah, yeah. basically but immediacy, that's, that's, that's what yeah. I'm working on. So there's this question uh, from Addy again, and he says, seeing in-browser developer tools flourish into flu fully blown editors is very exciting. And at, wh at what point should we stop pushing the envelope and suggest developers use their own tools? So do you think that will happen? Or will we push the envelope like far and beyond and use browser dev tools for everything? For me personally, right. I'm much more towards the end of using the browser as as close as possible. I, mean, I want to get the output, the rendered page, and what I'm typing as close as possible. I'm typing, I want to see the output immediately. I don't really, if it if it lives inside of the IDE itself, then fine. But at the moment, DevTools is kind of ticking that box for me. Right. Um, so are there any key parts that are missing from DevTools currently? So in any browser? For you, uh, for testing, for me, um, uh, event proxying. That's that's something I kind of uh, mention. That's in WebDriver. What's that? WebDriver's got that. <laughs> I haven't seen WebDriver. <laughs> <laughs> it's being standardised. Um, uh, so, if, like one thing that's missing for me is um, like, I don't want to type in a lat long to be able to emulate geolocation. I want my phone to give it to me. Um, uh, the accelerometer, I want that to feed straight into the, the, the desktop. Um, uh, I know Paul kind of, Paul and Addy have hinted at, or might mention something. Uh. Um, there's, there's likely going to be some more stuff uh, that would make Remy happy as far as developing in the browser more. Um, and and actually, to add on to a little bit of the the mobile tools and workflows, um, we talked a lot about you know what are the ways to to work with these devices. But the other thing is that a lot of times you can end up doing a lot of development just on desktop straight up. Um, Firefox is a fantastic responsive uh, design tool built into their dev tools now. Uh, inside Chrome, there's device metrics, and the, there's you know like 50 different sites and bookmarklets to get various different iframes so they can test your viewport for any site. Um, but things like emulating touch events, emulating uh, and spoofing geolocation, um, these are all in the browser now too. So there's there's a good amount that you can get away with um, on desktop before you go to the device to make sure that your performance goals are being met too. So I'd add that in. Right. So I think one of the things we're missing here are the audiences for testing, right? I mean, your workflow sounds very developer-centric, like you want to ma make sure that the CSS and the UX is perfect. The people that tend to use WebDriver tend to be more interested in the end-to-end -end testing and the functionality of the application, particularly as sort of a workflow or a walkthrough goes. Um, so I probably wouldn't recommend end-to-end -end testers use dev tools because it's not the right hammer to be hitting right. this particular nail with. Um, you know, and it's got to be like, take a look at what, what people are actually attempting to do and their relative skill levels and try and figure out what the best approach is. Um, you know, for a handful of people, being in the dev tools and being highly technical and getting all the metrics out of the browser is entirely the right thing to do. And that's a fantastic option for those people. But, you know, for hundreds of people, for, for a majority of developers, actually it's enough to be able to throw something together with a bit of Python or a small amount of JavaScript and use that to verify that, that the application is doing what it's meant to be doing. Um, so, yeah. Think about the audience of, of who's going to be using this um, and how they're going to be using it and how they're going to be integrating with the team. And it may turn out that actually not being in the browser is, is a better way of going about it. And sometimes, you know, it's going to be better to do things manually. Yeah. Does, this, does this feel right is a really hard question for a machine to answer, but a really easy question for a person to answer. Can I just tack on to the end of that? Um, yeah. I've, I can't remember who the conversations were with, but um, I've got a feeling it might have been Paul like a year ago. Um, web developers don't jump onto the command line as as frequently as like a, a Python developer or a Ruby developer. I mean, I'm comfortable with the command line, but I mean, out of the web developers here, if you're, I mean, you're probably you probably do back server side coding anyway. But hands up, who's pretty comfortable using the command line or coding up? Um, in fact, actually, this, this is a bit of a, <laughs> it's, a it's a technical audience. In yeah. The first place. yeah. <laughs> 
a loaded question and so on and so forth. But okay. you know, Let's go. there's that question as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it seems like having a, a huge number of mobile devices is the only way to reliably test on Android and Blackberry. Is there any hope of having accurate, reliable emulators for platforms other than iOS? I would add iOS to that list as well. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? So is, is there any hope for having really reliable emulators? No. Uh, excellent. <laughs> Just um, to give Opera props, isn't uh, the Opera emulator kind of exact, isn't supposed to be exactly the same as Opera Mobile? Yeah. Backed up. But it doesn't, obviously doesn't have the same fonts as Rabbit device. Okay, so. I th I hmm? Yeah. WebOS. <laughs> I th yeah, I think you could say that, you know, yeah, there is hope that they'll get it all, that they'll get better. Um, I would expect those vendors to, to put support into those tools, so yeah. Right. I, uh, more optimistically than just a flat no, I think the Pareto principle is going to kick in here. The 80-20 rule, you know, but testing on a simulator or an emulator is going to be fairly close and in the common case actually enough for our, our testing needs, but there's always going to be some weird quirk in the hardware um, that we're going to need the devices for. So are the emulators going to get enough where it'll move from the 8020 to 9010 or 955? I don't know. Um, but having seen the progress of the Android emulator, which has gone from being quite painful to use to actually being good enough to do a majority of my testing on, uh, particularly with the Intel uh, version that, that's available now, yeah, I'm, I'm actually relatively hopeful about hitting like the 9010 point. Excellent. Okay. Question over back. Yep. I just want to give a shout out to OpenDeviceLab.com, which is actually opening device labs all over the world right now. They got 40 locations. One of them is the Mozilla office. Google is think, thinking about it. So if you've got hardware that you don't use, you can donate it to one of them, and every developer can go there and try on real devices to play with their things. Because we can make emulators as much as we want. <coughs> Most of the errors come through touching and playing with the thing yes. on the real hardware. I mean, when we in, when when I put Firefox OS on uh, on S2s, three devices, same device, completely different results. So it's 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 not that easy. But Open Device Lab is a really really good idea for people that can't afford all these phones to actually play with them in an in an office that is a sharing space. And there's lots and lots of them worldwide. So just wanted to mention. That. There's also um, th I mean they also have a lot of information for people that want to set up their own device labs too, um, and community support for that. I also, uh, if I'm passing a phone shop, I'll just go in and have a play, see what's going on. And uh, uh, I recommend you do too, because the important thing to know is what's in the shop is what somebody could potentially be using like to access your site. So that's a great idea of what exactly is going on in the, in the market. And obviously, it's going to be market specific, but you'd be surprised at some of the travesties that are in phone shops nowadays. So, yeah. Uh, really quick. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, most of the emulator execution is somewhere else in the stack. There's a great company which has proven that they can run ARM code on x86 faster than ARM executes on ARM. So obviously the problem isn't with the ARM device or this instruction set. It's somewhere in the stack to get these mm -hmm. emulators up and running. Most of the time it's a balance between the teams trying to get their products out the door versus actually caring about, or to put it in a correct terminology since we're about to have beers, giving enough shits. Uh, about getting their emulators up and running. So if this is something that matters to web dev as a whole, you should definitely be putting more pressure on these uh, on these manufacturers to get their emulators up to speed to do things. So, yeah, excellent. Okay, so let's switch gears a bit. Okay, here's one of my questions: Will we get a solution for package management and module loading soon? There have been several tools that have shown that it can be done but there's no real consensus. And will ECMAScript 6 modules solve this? And Addy corrected me, so these are actually two questions in one. And package management is somewhat separate from module loading. So this is a real problem for a lot of developers. And Paul, perhaps you can start with this. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, so right now in client-side package management, uh, there's a few possibilities. Um, 
There, a while ago, there was a project called Ender, um, and the people who made Ender decided that it didn't really work out, so that's mostly dead. Uh, there's also Volo, uh, made by James Burke, who made who created um, Required JS, which is pretty cool. Uh, Bower, uh, originally released by Twitter, um, and there's also uh, a lot of folks using npm, sending it through Browserify, um, and getting it to work there. And uh, these are all kind of using different registry approaches, uh, different ideas on, on should we start an entire new uh, JavaScript library ecosystem from scratch or use one that's already available? Do we, use, do we just accept that we can use node packages inside the browser um, and make that work? Um, and, and it's a little, it's, it's kind of messy right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm most excited about what's happening with the Bower project. Um, it has about 900 packages in it, um, all working. Dependency resolution works fantastic. You actually get updated um, inside the UI when, uh, when a JavaScript library ships a new version, so it just kind of keeps you up to date. Um, and, uh, but uh, there, there's a lot of challenges because package management for client side is something where, like, it's useful when it hits a critical mass, and and I don't think we're we're there yet. So I'm looking forward to kind of um, seeing what we can do either inside this tool or another tool to kind of get there. Because without it, um, without package management client side, like everyone's going to be afraid of calling jQuery a dependency. And jQuery, you know, is is already too big. So uh, it could have been smaller had we had proper package management. Um, and I think it would really open up a, a lot of progress and forward momentum and what we're able to get away with on the front end uh, when we can actually create reasonable dependencies. So is this a problem where at one point standardizations should come in? Alex? <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about ES6 modules? So I've. Uh, Alex Russell, Google, uh, one of our representatives on TC39, um, the standards body for JavaScript. So uh, there is a module system coming in the next version of JavaScript. Will you be able to use that on all the devices that are deployed today? Well, that depends on whether or not you're targeting new browsers. So the answer is no, right? At least no in the short term. Uh, in the long term, you know, uh, well, in the intermediary, time, you'll be able to use tools like Tracer and other transpilers, you know, JavaScript to JavaScript compilers, uh, that will allow you to sort of program in the source language and, and convert to the other one based on a standard syntax, which sort of sets you up for a, a living in the wonderful future that will eventually arrive. So um, that's a strategy that you can use today. There's a little bit of tension right now uh, in the committee about what's going to happen with the particulars of the syntax and some of the semantics, and we're ironing those out now. But the goal for us is to have a version of the language that has this done more or less feature complete by the end of the year. So. Wish us luck, and uh, I guess uh, if you'd like to start using what is likely to become the module system for uh, the next version of ECMAScript today, it's not a package manager, it's just a module system, but you can uh, check out Tracer and a couple of other transpilers that are starting to support it. Okay. So while you have the mic, I want to ask you another question. <laughs> <laughs> so what should be the role of standardization in web development tooling and testing, and what are some of the areas that would benefit from standardization right now? Okay, so um, with my non-Google hat on, with my um, uh, W3C tag member hat on, okay. let me answer the question in terms of what's the role of a standards body. Um, my view is that the role of a standards body, and this is not the tag's view, but it's my personal view, is that the role of a standards body is to hold the coats Well everybody gets yelled at to go have a fight inside of a ring, right? They set the rules and they hold the coats where people duke it out inside um, some preordained uh, boxing ring. And they aren't let out again until users have one answer. Right? The goal here is to get users to say, holy cow, you guys have made this really hard. You might all have some answer, but we need one standard answer. And that usually only happens when, A, everybody understands the problem. So until everybody understands the problem, if there's some vocal minority that says, look, there's this giant problem, well, that's probably not enough to get a standards effort to a successful conclusion. So if everyone understands the problem and there are competing answers, that's sort of the predicate for a successful standards scrum. You can't really start the game until that, those set of conditions have been met. So it's good for browser vendors to innovate, to start 
working together to collaboratively look at what's happening inside the world, what are libraries doing, what are the compilers doing, you know, where are we fa falling down in the job, where are users yelling at, at us most loudly. And once that happens, go to the standards body and say, okay, well this is the subset of what we clearly understand is a relatively good answer, let's standardize that. And then to hopefully integrate more of what is then collectively understood to be the right problem or the right answer as time passes. Okay, thanks. Simon? What's your experience from being on W3C group for testing and tooling? Yeah, so WebDriver's in a really interesting space in that it's a de facto standard that we're turning into a de jure standard. Um, you know, a lot of the tools that Paul, Paul was talking about earlier, um, anything that connects to Source Labs is using the WebDriver APIs. Um, you know, uh, that, that Michael Tam's uh, fighting, fighting layout bugs, that uses WebDriver. Um, it keeps on cropping up in these sort of unusual places. The the Appium stuff that uses the wire protocol from WebDriver, um, and so yeah, what we're attempting to do right now is go. What we need is is that work is currently being done by a relatively small open source team, um, and they're brilliant. They are an amazing team, um, but we're now at the point, and we're past the point where in, in order to make the 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 things that people want to be able to test work properly. We need the aid and help of the people writing the browsers. We need to be baked into the browsers. Uh, Opera were the first people that stepped up to the plate and went, you know what, we could actually do this. Um, and the Opera driver was a fantastic step forward um, and was incredibly fast and incredibly stable. Uh, Chrome followed relatively swiftly after that. And we went from having a fairly buggy, painful to use Chrome driver to something that was amazing. Um, Mozilla, uh, we, we talk about M-Day on the project. Mozilla have a project called Marionette, which is their implementation of the WebDriver APIs. Okay. Um, so my experience has been actually really, really positive. Like everybody sees the need for these things. Everyone is pulling together and we're all just trying to figure out the nicest way of standardizing these things. Is Microsoft on that list? So yes, Microsoft, Apple. Um, there are now representatives from Microsoft on the working group uh, on the working group mailing list, and I think they're planning on showing up to the next um, to the next face to face session. Uh, there were Microsoft representatives at TPAC this uh, last year in 2012 as well, um, who attended uh, a full day of discussion. Uh, so actually, Microsoft obviously they don't tell us everything, but they are taking it seriously. Um, Apple or Apple, and nobody knows quite what's going to happen there. Uh, I, but I think it's inevitable, right? I really hope it's inevitable because everyone else is doing it. We're turning it into a standard, and there are people who implement it because it's good for the users, and there are people who implement it because they like to be seen as conforming to standards. Um, and the more pressure we apply by right. allowing more of these checkboxes to be applied the right. better. So are there any other tools that are going to get standardized? I saw the charter and it had console API from developer tools and is yeah. that going to happen soon? So there's, um, uh, so there's a draft spec for standardizing console API. Um, mostly uh, it just needs more work. Um, but right now actually console API, console API is extremely consistent across browsers. Um, all the, there, there's like a bunch of different features in console log that most people don't know about, that are that are actually implemented across browsers. Um, just uh, last summer, we changed the definition of the um, the dollar sign symbol in the command line API in the console. And uh, while it's not in any standard, we just talk to the guys who make Firebug, the Firefox developer tools, the Opera guys, and we all just changed it at once. And so kind of like these things stay in sync pretty well um, without the standard being published. Yep. Um, yeah. There is a browser tools and testing working group yep. that if anyone's interested, they should think about joining at the W3C. Um, and uh, I think there's some effort to actually kickstart that and give it some, some shape and form. Uh, you may know a bit more about that, Paul, than I do. Yeah, okay. There's there's an effort, and I'm not quite sure how far it's gone, but it'll happen. Is the debugger protocol, is that part of the standard, or is it just that it's been written and looks like a standard? Uh, the 
uh, the we debugger protocol. About the which protocol? Who's debugger protocol? Is that the, Scope or the Firefox no, one or the, the WebKit one? The one that came out of WebKit that, like I said, it, it looked like a standard Scope, looked like it came from Opera. Right. The debugger protocol looked like Chrome and Safari were kind of adhering to it and. Yeah, so so both are both are published open specifications um, and both designed for use in a generalized fa fa fashion. Um, uh, I think Firefox was the last one to add support for remote debugging, um, and they didn't use uh, either of these two protocols. Um, so I don't expect to see standardization along these lines, um, which is a bummer. But that's just not yet. Oh, yeah. Weird. So we have time for a few more questions. Andrew? Yeah. Okay, so let's get one in. Uh, what's the best way to test against varying network conditions in real life? We have devices that are constantly changing uh, networks, switching between speeds and such. So how do you test this? There's two ways, uh, two, the two best ways I know. Um, there's Charles Proxy. Um, uh, runs on all platforms, um, can simulate a lot of different network conditions, uh, including packet loss and throttled bandwidth. And um, anyone on, on Lion or better on uh, OS X is, uh, can, if they install Xcode, they can get this thing called Link Conditioner, um, which is just in system preferences. And it has a few presets for uh, packet loss percentage and bandwidth throughput, um, but you can mimic uh, a few different common profiles, which are pretty cool. Can I um, also add something there? I've, I've, something I've noticed is that uh, the iPhone behaves differently when it has a Wi-Fi connection, regardless of whether or not it's on 3G, as in tethered, um, to when it doesn't have a Wi-Fi. It does different things. Um, so being able to condition, like, I, I mean, iOS 6 has the network conditioner thing on the actual device as well, so you can play around with that. Um, but seeing real network traffic when you're not on Wi-Fi, it, 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 the phone acts differently when it's on Wi-Fi to when it's not on Wi-Fi. Um, it, when it's on Wi-Fi, it sends shitloads of data over the wire. And um, I found some, an article this morning and tweeted a link to show you how to sniff traffic whilst it's on 3G, um, connecting through the USB. But uh, it just uh, it's something to be wary of, basically. Right. Okay, so can we get native support for proxy events? So I, oh, sorry. Just, just one additional question. Um, testing things like app cache and simulating offline whilst remote debugging, is it is it possible? We try like blacklisting domains in Charles, and that kind of half simulates it, but not not totally. Not yet. Yeah, at, in lots of the web driver implementations, um, there's an expectation there's a working network stack. Uh, and if you go offline, that disappears. Oh. We just shut down, I mean, offline, we shut down the server. Um, that's how we, t we, I mean, we didn't, I mean, we're not emulating it, we're just killing the server that's trying to connect to you, so it kind of fakes it. Okay, so here's one from Remy. Can we get native support for proxy events in DevTools injecting geolocation based on Google Maps and both things? We kind of touched on that earlier, didn't we, so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can answer, Paul, if you want to. No. <laughs> so here's one for you, Remy. You had a recent blog post that touched upon course. So the the headers we use to get cross domain addicts requests, uh, and there was like a lengthy discussion after that post. And uh, can you explain what the discussion was about? The uh, the discussion on Google Plus or the discussion on the comments. The discussion that touched upon that we're not sure actually how to use cars headers on which uh, elements. It did, who asked the question? Because you might be able to clarify it for me. So it, it was actually my question. That was your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your last blog post. So yeah, it started up quite, quite a discussion uh, about when to use cars on uh, oh, images. Yeah. So I, I, I basically said, just turn that shit on. <laughs> um, and I linked to, um, I'm going to butcher his name, um, Anne, Anne Van Fistren? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's got a blog post that says turn cores on for XHR, but basically Ajax. And I'm suggesting if you're a 
Flickr or Instagram or something with uh, images, and I think actually there's some other asset types, you should turn on cause support for that. So send access origin uh, star. There's, there's a link at the bottom of the blog post that, that opens a discussion about uh, the security, the security implementa uh, implications if you add a star rule and there's a back and forth between um, Anne and uh, uh, Malta uh, from Google now. I don't really know how it ended, but I so want to see these, particularly image services, giving us uh, um, cross-origin rules to allow us to import that data into things like Canvas and have full access to that data so we can you know, remix the, uh, the image data and produce new content. Um, I can't remember. There's something else that you can put it on as well. There's a, uh, if you're really lazy, um, just add the uh, Apache config that's in HTML5 boilerplate because uh, it enables this cores for images automatically. So do you think that it's, it's a place where tools can improve to give you uh, more information on how you should use a mechanism or an API because there was like a lot of misunderstanding on should you be doing this? Is it secure? Is it not secure? Are we doing pre five requests or not? So like when you're writing code, should you get a warning from your IDE and say, hey, look, this is something you probably are not an expert in. Check these sections in the standard or check this like. Yeah, I'd say I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for providing a bit, bit more context of what you're right, seeing. Right. Like, uh, yeah, if you're looking at the headers and and you're misusing uh, a, a, one of the new security headers, yeah. like the tool should be able to let you know and, and tell you where you can find more documentation on yeah. how to use it correctly. Same situation on on performance when when you're getting back a lot of information, it can give you some some guidance and some resources to learn better about what this means. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thanks, everyone.